Sorry, I'm late. I was expecting to buzz me and she kept saying one more, one more. I know on. how it is. <laughs> yes, we're on. We're on, dear. <laughs> well, um, I you think one and then the other, no, 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 because they were just waiting. Oh, you I'm know. sorry, I was just so. Uh, say, well, I just put my jacket on to leave, and she said, "Can I have one with the jacket?" Okay, I'll put the one with oh, the jacket. Oh, one with the jacket. Yes, okay. Oh, Dolly. Oh. Hi, hello. Hi. Well, uh, you have to have hello. this on. What? What is it? Oh, it's a microphone. Okay, mm. let me get relaxed. Just like this, you know. Because I'll be too hot like that. Like the TV, right? Mm. Well, I was just sort of... Rabbiting? Rabbiting on, right. Hello, hello, testing, yeah, testing. Fine. Let me... Dave. Dave. Hello, Dave. John, pleasure. Yeah, I'm Hello. sure I've heard your voice. Which one is the talker, you? You are both the talker? Yeah. How are you? You're not John Paul, George, Ringo and Bert, are you? <laughs> not that Bert. <laughs> it's the only Bert I know. Oh, I know the other Bert. Good night, Bert. Warny, <laughs> Ernie. Right. Okay, Bert. Mm. Boys and they Ginger. Me to death. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Well, look, I'm being a lot of Sesame Street, me and Sean, so yeah. I know all the characters. You know, it what comes was that twice ripping? Twice a day in LA. It comes on at nine in the morning. Yep. And then yeah. at five in the afternoon, they do a repeat of the same. Yeah, well, we get it on Channel G at seven till eight, from nine till ten on PBS, and then evening sometime or other. Is that mine? Oh, that yes, was the sir. noise. I was Your looking for it all over the place. Okay. Here we are. Yeah. Whenever you're ready. Mm. Whatever. Hey, mm. Sorry to interrupt. Mm. Mm. Well, I'd like to ask one you weren't interrupting. Yes. A question to both of you. Um, what is a typical day? I think of the listeners would like to hear this one. What is a typical day in the life of, of you? Why don't you explain it? Well, mm. uh, your side of it. <laughs> yeah, there's a sort of basic day. They vary slightly. If we're, if we're making records and that, that's different, but without, when we're not doing records and being up late. I get up about six, go to the kitchen, get a cup of coffee, cough a little, have a cigarette, papers arrive at seven, Sean gets up seven twenty, twenty-five. I oversee his breakfast, don't cook it anymore, got fed up with that one, <laughs> but I make sure I know what he's eaten. Yoko if she's not really, really busy, sometimes I wake up and she's already down here in this office. But if it's not that kind of pressure going on, she might pass through the kitchen on the way to the office, where I'm, whereas I'll make her a cup of espresso to get her down the elevator good. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I'll hang around there until about nine. Sean's sort of had his breakfast and him and his nanny Helen are deciding what to do for the day, you know. And I make sure he watches PBS and not the cartoons with the commercials. I don't mind cartoons, but I won't let him watch the commercials. So make sure he's, if he's going to watch something that morning, it's going to be Sesame Street. Then uh, the Sean and the nanny will go off somewhere and do something. And I'll go back to my room. It's the bedroom, but I do everything there. I mean, I have instruments and you know, records and whatever I do, I always like do. I used to say, if you can't do it in bed, mm -hmm. you can't do it anyway. <laughs> I'm a bit like Hugh Hefner, you know, it's all like the bed is, controls the whole thing. <laughs> then if uh, I'll buzz down and see what, what Yoko's doing downstairs, because we have the intercom running between upstairs and downstairs. If the day's not too hectic, we can meet for lunch and go out to lunch. If not, I'll, if I haven't got anything outside of the house to do, I will go back in uh, at 12 to see that Sean gets a good lunch and be with him while he eats, even if I don't eat. And then it just goes on like that, and she's still in the office, and then after lunch, she usually goes and does something else with the nanny, you know, it, that presuming they've come in for lunch, generally they do. And then I will have that from maybe one till five, I'll take for myself to do whatever I want to do, stay in, go out, read, write, whatever. Five, five thirty, I start coming, looking around to see that if Sean's got back again. You know, if he's back from wherever he's gone, or it's getting time for dinner. Six, we eat dinner. Usually Yoko's still down in the office, so... Then we have dinner, seven o'clock, bath. This is Sean, my life revolves around Sean. Seven o'clock, bath. Daddy goes in to watch Walter Cronkite. 
7.30, there's usually some kids stuff on, right? I let him watch commercial TV if I'm there, because when the commercials come off, I just flick my little switch which goes on to radio. So I don't mind if he watches them without hearing them, it's different. 7.30 till 8, he watches something. I take him to his bedroom, kiss him goodnight. The nanny probably reads him the story, or whatever they get up to in there, and he's in bed by 8. Then I'll give a buzz downstairs, say, what the hell are you doing down there? You're still down there? If I'm lucky, she'll come up and maybe we can do something. But some, she's a workaholic, so she's liable to, to go on until... Uh, she'll sometimes come back, at 10, come back up at 10 o'clock at night and take two hours sort of rest and then start work again at 12 midnight because she's always calling the West Coast or England or Tokyo or some godforsaken place that is on the different time zone. From, and that's a regular day. How do you feel the two of you, you and Sean, have grown from your extreme close relationship? Well, he's, I don't know whether it's because uh, he was born on the same day as me, which that in itself was quite strange. He was born on October the 9th, um, which I was, so we're almost like twins. You know, the funny thing, if, if, if he doesn't see me a few days or if I'm really, really busy, you know, and I just sort of get a glimpse of him, or if I'm feeling depressed without him even seeing me, he sort of picks up on it and he, he starts getting that way. So it's like I can no longer afford to have artistic depressions, which usually produced a <laughs> miserable song, but it was uh, something I could use, you know. So if I start going really deep, sort of wallowing in a, a depression, to it, I kind of enjoy it or whatever one does with them, the best you can, he'll start coming down with stuff, you know, so I'm sort of obligated to keep up. And, but sometimes I can't because something will make me depressed and there's no way I can deal with it. And then he's sure as hell he'll get a cold or come or trap his finger in the door or something will happen, you know. And so now I have a sort of more reason to stay healthy and bright. I cannot w no longer wallow in it and say, well, this is how artists are supposed to be, I suppose. You make a write the blues, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's it, pretty regularly like that. And like this weekend was a big deal because he went off with his nanny to Pennsylvania so I could slob around and I didn't have to, you know. Silence, quiet. You know, I could eat when I wanted to right. eat because I never really want to eat at the same time. I'm never hungry at the same time. So it was very quiet in the apartment. and you we just get so up early on Saturday. Well, I tend to get up early anyway. I got up at six this morning anyway because I'm just tuned to that now. I'm interested in why you don't want to watch commercials. What? What is it? Because they hypnotize you. I don't want him asking for junk food every 10 minutes because his basic diet is pretty health food oriented, although I don't make him suffer, you know, and he can get his ice cream, preferably hagen dazs maybe once a week. I try and discourage it in the winter because it's, you know, winter. And his nanny is not a health food girl, and she's, I call her the dairy queen. You know, I try and li <laughs> limit the amount of dairy he takes because it creates mucus. But uh, if he goes to friends' houses, he eats what they eat and things like that. But with the commercials, I love commercials as an art form, I really do. Um, the way they're made as films, and I really admire them. I think the best directors are in there, not making movies, they're making commercials. But that constant repetition, I've tried letting it go for a bit, and he can't help it, even though we discuss it, he can't help wanting things he doesn't really want. And it's hard enough bringing up a kid without dealing with these requests for garbage all the time. You know? He can go to McDonald's occasionally. I don't want him going there every day and living on junk food. Yes. So that's basically it. And, and they're selling the, the sugar. We don't eat sugar mainly. Although I'm guilty of it when I, I make records. Because it gives me energy. But in, for about, since I met Yoko in 1966, I have not taken sugar as part of my diet. And the, the damn commercial, the programs are great for kids. I'm no, I'm no even qualms about violent cartoons because they, he understands cartoons as opposed to film. It's that constant sugar, 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 and the only break is hamburger, cheeseburger, hamburger, cheeseburger, sugar, 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 sugar. And I think it uh, destroys the child's physical health and therefore affects his mental health. You consider yourself fortunate to be able to spend the amount of time both that way. Uh, I do consider myself fortunate, but I took the time. Any, any famous star or whatever it is where you come under, the, and, and I'm not going to name any names, but many of them <coughs> had problems with their kids, either, you know, either killing themselves or sh in various ways. I don't buy that bit about, you know, um, 
quality over quantity. You know, like an hour a week of intense rolling in the hay together is better than, you know, 20 minutes every day of you being bitchy and, and just being yourself around him. So I don't try and be the God Almighty kind of figure that never uh, is always smiling and such this wonderful father. I'm not putting out an image of this person who knows all about... Nobody knows about children. That's the thing. You look in the books, there's no real experts. Everybody's got a different opinion. You learn by default in a way. And I made a lot of mistakes already, but what can you do? But uh, I, I think it's better for him to see me as I am. If I'm grumpy, I'm grumpy. If I'm not, I'm not. If I want to play, I'll play. If I don't, I don't. I don't kowtow to him. I'm straight with him as I can be. And uh, yes, I can afford to take the time, but uh, anybody with a working wife might be able to afford to take the time if they're not really got a working wife because they're poor and they both have to work because of the cost of living. That's what I was thinking, yeah. because now we have so many... But I know lots of dads who aren't working that hard or just sitting in an office all day anyway to avoid life, Going you know, home. I mean, <laughs> they're sitting behind desks and they're doing nothing, just shuffling paper, right, waiting for lunchtime to get a cocktail. But I don't buy that, you know, my career is so important that uh, I'll deal with the kids later, bit, which I already did with my first marriage, my first child, and I kind of regret it. Problems, and God willing, I won't, or we won't later on, or maybe we will, I don't know. I'm just hoping that whatever I give now, which is time, I won't have to pay, because I think you can't cheat kids. If you cheat them when they're children, They'll make you pay when they're 16 or 17 by revolt against you or hating you or the, all those so-called teenage problems. I don't really think that, that that's an inborn nature thing. I think that's finally when they get old enough to stand up to you and say what a hypocrite you, you've been all this time. You never give, give me what I really wanted, which was you. So I'm hoping that, I'm really, really looking at it in a calculating way really, give him now, maybe he won't be so frantic when he's 16 and 17. You think if, that's happening in the society right now? I think that's what happened to all of us, you know. I think that idea of, you know, no breastfeeding, uh, don't touch them, you'll spoil them, I think that's all lunacy from some lunatic. You see, I know it's almost the same in America. <laughs> Male children in England were brought up to, be, to defend the country. I mean, that was about it, you know, you had to have discipline and not count, not touch the kid. He had to be a hard nut, a, child, a, a boy was really programmed to go in the army. That was about it, you know. And you had to be tough and you're not supposed to cry and you're not supposed to show emotion. And I know Americans show more emotion and more open than English people, but it's pretty similar over here. There's that Calvinist, Protestant, Anglo-Saxon ethic, which is don't touch, don't react, don't feel. And I think that's what screwed us all up. And I think it's time for a change. So it's you interesting you made, that, you made that comment about, you know, it's not an excuse that you're not a pop star because I'm sure there are people that will listen to this interview when they hear you say that and say, oh, sure, John and Yoko, they can, they can stand back and say, sure, we can spend time. We have to do all these things. Well, I... Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, Yoko was a poor artist when I met her, okay? And living in not the best conditions. And she had a child, and the child went wherever she went, you see. She didn't treat her first child like and I treated mine. Even on stage, you know. She took her <laughs> on stage, you know, I mean, a little squirking thing. Mm -hmm. on the, and she would take her when they were making movies, because I saw before we got together, I, I've seen her work and the way she worked, and the, the Kyoko was running around all over the place. And there are many artistically inclined people that have worked like that in the past not since the 60s, but in the 30s and any other time. So even if I was poor, it's the state of mind I'm in. I would work out some way for him to be around us somehow, okay? I would have chosen my career to suit that. And uh, it's not, it, you don't have to be rich to love your kids. So you made this conscious decision to give yourself to your son, to the relationship. And to learn from him too. You know, I learned a lot from the, from the child because they're not hypocrites and they're not phony and they know when you're put... They, I mean, he knows already, you know, I mean, already uh, he, he makes me feel... You know, anybody with a child that spent any moment with them, you know, uh, you know, and it's good for you, I think, because one does tend to fool oneself and the kids don't buy it.
Well, they know when you're not. You oh. hit the nail on the head when you said you got to be straight with them. Yeah. They know when you're not straight with them. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll call you. I mean, I, I, I call Jack. I'm in San Francisco and Burr's in L.A. now, and I call Jack to wish him happy birthday. It's fourth, fourth birthday, so I called to wish him happy birthday. Well, I was a day late. It's so Monday night. Football, yeah. And I called yeah, and said, Jack, yeah. happy birthday. It's not my birthday. It's yesterday. <laughs> oh, sorry. So terrible. Yeah, terrible. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> it was yesterday. Mm. He was saying, remember? That he wants to be a daddy when he's old. Oh yeah, this is <laughs> because I hadn't been in the studio for f five years or whatever, so he's used to me being around all the time. Because it's no, it's a pleasure for me to hang around the house. I was always a homebody. I think a lot of musicians are. You know, they you write and you play in the house anyway. Or as when I was a, wanting to be a painter when I was younger, I was all in the house or write poetry. It was always in the house. But uh, I started the work, you know, and he started seeing a bit less of me. I'd let him come to the studio, but it was a bit boring. He was excited, but long story short, at the end of the session, and it was going on, I got back on a night schedule where I'd be coming in when he'd be getting up. So he'd see me at breakfast, but I was a different, I was a sort of shredded, okay, what, oh, mm, like that. And then one day we were sort of lying down on the bed together, so I'm maybe uh, watching some cartoon or whatever. And... He just sat up and said, you know what I want to be when I grow up? And I said, no, what's that? He looked me right in the eye and said, just a daddy. <laughs> and I thought, I thought mm -hmm. I said, you mean you don't like it, that I'm working now, right? And going out a lot. He says, right. I said, well, I'll tell you something, Sean. It makes me happy to do the music. And I might be less, I might have more fun with you if I'm happier, right? He said, mm-hmm. <laughs> that was the end of that. I mean, I, I, was, I think I was BSing him, you know, but I, he caught me off guard there because he, I, just a daddy. It was his way of expressing. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty straight, wasn't it? <laughs> right, right. When you leave your kids, they feel, they feel sometimes like you're robbing them of something. When I left, I left yesterday, and I'll be home tonight. Yeah. Bye, Jack. Bye, Joe. And Joe's only two. I say goodbye to Jack. And <laughs> he got pissed. I know. He, he does. Into his room. Mm -hmm. and, but then I called when I got here to New York. I said hi, and then it was different. Mm -hmm. okay. I was guilty all through the mostly of making double fantasy, I must say. We had his picture pin in the studio because I didn't want to lose contact with what I'd got. I was scared myself that moving it back into the business and getting, one tends to hone in on yourself and the sound of the record and how you're doing it. We had his picture up there all the time, at, in between the speakers, so whenever you list check in the stereo, he was looking at me all the time. And I went through some terrible guilt, you know, <laughs> absolutely. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. But I didn't want to put it, put it on one side, because I knew part of it was, I needn't feel guilty, I'm entitled, and I have to have my own space too, but still, God, it racks you. But at the same time, maybe we were giving him a space too. Oh yeah, he needs the space too, because I'm obviously, you know, you know, when I'm not around, he relaxes more with Helen about how he eats and the knife and fork business. And I do tend to sort of want him to be a little gentleman, or maybe it's not that necessary. And, you know, part of that English upbringing comes out. And I'm saying, well, that's American style of eating. That's fine. You use the fork. Now, if you're going to use the knife, you, that's, you know. And Japanese, will use the chopstick properly. You know, don't pick them around and shove it around, you know. So he, he does need a break from me, too. Mm. And also, you see, as you said, I mean, a, a happy father is better than a, a grumpy father. Yeah, but I heard those women who were saying, you know, I'm going to fulfill myself by having a job, you know, so you mm. just... I wish there was a system where they had, you know, community daycare and places where they would be happy to be, not that you foist them off like kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I sent him to kindergarten for a bit, but he was miserable and bored. And I realized I really, really sent him because I thought I'd get more space to myself. And he was not happy. I wasn't happy either because I wasn't using the space. I was thinking, what's going on? I mean, am I doing this for the right reasons? Why am I... D there are some different kinds of schools that you can send your kids to that they, they won't be miserable and bored. Like Jack goes to a school for just four hours, three times a week. Just to, they learn different things, but mostly to play with kids his own age. And well, he sees them. He knows what time they come off school. He's on that phone. Maxie comes back at 3.30. <laughs> He dials next door, he knows they're coming home. So he knows there's only a few hours when they're all at school anyway. And his vocabulary is fantastic because he's been with children more, uh, grown-ups more than children. And actually they don't need that companionship till about six and seven, they can really relate to other kids. An hour together with other kids, it always 
tension or, you know, who wants to be center of attention after an hour's play together, you usually have to split them up for a bit because they get, they're not really ready to allow each other space and have real friendships, although he has a real friendship with this, with about three kids. But still, you know, six or seven is more important, I think, for that community thing. And I tell him, if he says, uh, you know, if he gets that bored feeling, I say, well, you know where your friends are? The two blocks down the street here, they're at the school. He says, ah, I'll wait till four. Because he knows, who, all they learn is to sit still. Would you consider yourself a strict mother and father? Uh, the, at least his moral code and what is right and wrong and what you're... Well, you see, if I knew the secrets of what, of what is right and wrong, well, I wish we all knew the secrets. Nobody really knows, that's the point. Nobody ne really knows what's best for children or whatever. They're like guinea pigs that each generation experiments on. You know, I know if you go too far to the liberal side, they'll probably go up, grow up being disciplinarians. If you give them too much discipline, they'll end up the opposite. I'm trying to just have no real heavy discipline about behavior, only don't be impolite, don't hurt other people. And yes, you do have to clean your teeth after you've eaten. When you eat, you eat. <laughs> and that, then you play after, not both at the same time, and regular bedtime. I think regularity is good for them. I, we did try the other thing of let him sleep when he wants to sleep. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. He, he enjoyed the freedom, and in that way he relaxed. But on the other hand, he started getting tired. So. And, and whining. So but I thought, he no, has this to be disciplined work. in a way, you know, because... Uh, oh, well, I do discipline And you him. do. I never I would hit him. So I always I cooperate, don't I? And I always say, Daddy knows You're one of the best, best fathers he's ever had. <laughs> 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 well, you better ask your daddy no, because she, he knows She's still a, a, a real mother because when it comes to the bit about who's tired and irritable, she can deal with him when she's tired and irritable and I That's still find true. it hard then. To, to give and have him crawling over me when I'm tired and irritable. I, I, I need that rest to deal with him. The other thing that's very strange is probably Are we talking about child reading or records here? What is <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the funny thing is that there must be some sort of physical connection and that's why, you know, I can relax about it. I don't feel that even wh when he's far away, um, far away, I mean, it's upstairs, but I'm here working. Um, that we're sort of connected and we know what we're doing because um, he buzzes he down gets, to the office all the time you know, and he gets hurt or something and the other day I just suddenly woke up very early in the morning and I heard him cry but I mean I, it was just an instant after I woke up that he started crying mm -hmm. and I just rushed over and there was that sort of feeling like I already knew what was going to happen you know it's also, she never is, uh, however busy she is, she'll never stop him coming in. Even if she's in a really important business meeting, even if she, he comes in and she says, well, he sees that, you know, this would be boring if he walked in now. He'd like, check it out and maybe interrupt a little, but it would be boring for him. So he'd go away, but so he knows there's access there. So in that way, we're lucky that our, our work space is within the building. But that goes for any artist, rich or poor but they do tend to work in their own homes or lofts or apartments. So in that respect, I think a lot of people are doing, do what we do anyway. Because if you work in the apartment, you live in it, it's all the same place. It's not a place where daddy or mummy has to go across town or get a commute every day. So in that way, musicians and artists have the a benefit that maybe ordinary people couldn't get. I want to ask you about getting the urge make music again now. Oh, it came over me all of a sudden, love. I didn't know what came over me. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like you were possessed. Right? Yes, I was possessed by this rock and roll devil, you know. Yes, yes, it's like yeah. that. Yeah, well, is that the question? Did I interrupt you? Um, you got it. <laughs> Why suddenly and all that? Yeah. Well, partly because suddenly I got the songs. You know. You never know, you know, those things just come to you. Just suddenly, like had, if you pardon the expression, diarrhea of creativity. <laughs> and uh, in fact, we went in the studio and cut about 22 tracks and cut it down to 14 to, to make the dialogue. They were down. all dialogue songs, meaning that we, ha we were write writing as if it was a play and we were the two characters in it but it's real life but not real as well because on a, a song or a record it can't be real 
I mean, we could have taken it a step further and made this record so may maybe she would be called Ziggy Stardust and I would be called Tommy. <laughs> and then you would call it a rock opera, you see? But we always worked from our own selves as near as we could. So the, uh, the album, the work we did on this thing is really a play, but we're using ourselves as the characters. And what we sing about in the record and the songs are is as our real diaries of how we feel but also it's always not really really real because it's a song and it's on a record and you, you project it in a different way but we started this thing and i started getting these songs and i called her i said it look she had we had discussed going back in the studio but i didn't have the material but i wasn't worried about it because i thought well i haven't done it for a long time it'll maybe I, if i switch into that there'll be something there but it just sort of came and i called her because i was in bermuda with sean and she was here in New York. I called her and I said, well, look, uh, we were talking about recording. It must have triggered something off here because I'm getting all this stuff. <laughs> and I started singing it to her down the phone or playing a cassette. And she would call back two hours later and say, well, when you sang, sang that, losing you, or I, I, she'd come back with moving on or something. <laughs> and then I'd say, oh, moving on, okay. And then I'd be swimming or doing anything, suddenly something else would come like starting over. I'd say, hey, well, look, this is what happened. And it started working like, coming out like that. So then I couldn't wait to get back and start then. It just, I suddenly had all this material. After not really trying, but not, not trying either for five years, I'd been so locked in the, the, the home environment and completely switched my way of thinking that I, it, I didn't really think about music at all. My guitar was sort of hung up on behind the bed, literally. <laughs> and I did, don't think I took it down in five years. Yoko was telling us about the emotional impact of hearing your songs to her for the first time. How did you feel hearing her material? It, it inspired me completely. I got, as soon as she would sing something to me or play the cassette down the phone, I would, within 10 or 15 minutes, whether I wanted to work or not, if you call <laughs> it work, I would suddenly get this song coming to me. And I always felt that the best songs were ones that came to you rather than... I do have the ability to, you know, if you ask me to write a song for a movie or something, and they, they say, it's about this, I, d I can sit down and sort of make a song. I wouldn't be thrilled with it, but I can make a song like that. But I find it difficult to do that, but I can do it. You know, I call it craftsmanship, you know. I've had enough years at it to, to sort of put something together, but I never enjoyed that. I like it to be inspirational from the spirit. And being with Sean and switching off from the business sort of allowed that channel to be free for a bit. You know, it wasn't always on. It was switched off. And when I sort of switched it on again, zap, all this stuff came through. So now we're already, well, we did half, enough material for the next album, almost half as much. And we're already talking about the third album, so we're full of vim and vigor. Did you know after you heard the album, when it was completed, after the first time you heard it, did you know that it was going to be accepted like that? No, we didn't know anything, did we? Really? You know, you go through two ways. Sometimes you think, wow, yeah, great. We, this is great. We've done it. And then the next time you hear it, well, she, she's not a, quite the same as I'll think, no, this is not right. It's not right. Yeah. So I would go yay and nay on it all the time. But I think, uh, basically, we thought we if people it. will exactly listen to it for what it is <laughs> and not listen to it with preconceived ideas of how it ought to be or as compared to something else, then if people could listen to it just as if it wasn't even John and Yoko, just that it came over the radio and you accept it or not accept it as you hear it, not as you expect to hear John Lennon or expect to hear Yoko Ono or expect to hear an ex-Beatle or expect to hear whatever. or having read some, a good review or a bad review, forget about that. Just get it on the radio, I thought, and it'll be all right. Uh, the way I looked at it was probably, it's an album that's not going to do too well, but in the end, you know, maybe like two years later, something people say, ah, that was good. Because I knew that the theme was good, I knew the dialogue was important, etc. And each song was all right, you know. So I had a feeling that, that even if it takes a long time, people would know about it, you know. But it w I, I didn't know it was going to be that instant, you know. 
You went out on a limb with this, though. You took yeah. a lot of very personal love songs and laid them out for everybody. Mm. How, how does that feel to you? How do you feel about, after five years of silence, bearing yourselves to people in interviews and music? Because, you know, even as I put it in my last incarnation, everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey. Mm -hmm. Mm. It means really that, you know, one cannot be absolutely oneself in public because the fact that you're in public makes you you have to have some kind of defense or whatever it is but we always tried from whether it's from two virgins through imagine through anything we've done together the films we made together we always tried to get as near to the un, uncensored as it were for what we are not to project an image of something that we're not because having been in that sort of pop business so long and tried to retain myself throughout it, but obviously not always being successful at that. It was most uncomfortable when I didn't feel I was being myself. You know, when I would have to smile when I didn't want to smile. And it became like all that, like being a politician, you know. And I, I, what I really got through this five years was I'm not running for office. I like to be liked. I don't like to offend people. I would like to be a happy, contented person. I don't want to have to sell my soul again, as it were, to have a hit record. It's, I've discovered that I can live without, without it, and it makes it happier for me. But I'm not going to come back in and try and create a persona who would not be myself. Does that explain it? Yeah. Do you think that the combination <coughs> of removing yourself from the music scene and then also the, the artist that have to deliver an album every six months. Okay, it's time. Yeah, well, I went. We want an album, and he's got to sit down and crank it out. Would that spawn the creativity that you were talking about? Just letting it. Yes. Yeah. It was to give. It's like the 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 channels on the radio were jammed. You know, I was not getting clear signals, and after ten or fifteen, almost twenty years of being under contract, and having to produce two or three two albums a year in the early days and, and a single every three months regardless of what the hell else you were doing or what your family life was like what your personal life was like nothing counted you just have to get those songs up now paul and i turned out a lot of songs those days and uh it was easier because it was the beginning of uh, our uh business you know relationship so and career Paul and I developed in public, as it were. We had a little rehearsal in private, but mainly we developed our abilities in public. But then it got to be format, and sort of not the pleasure that it was, and that's when I felt that I'd lost myself. Not that I was on purpose, purposely being a hypocrite or a phony, but it, it took like, it took something away from what I set out to do. I started out to do the, rock and roll because I absolutely like doing it. So that's why we, I ended up doing a track like Starting Over. It's kind of tongue in cheek. You know, it's, <laughs> it's that, you know, it's sort of a la Elvis and that. And I, I, I hope people accept it like that. I, I think it's a serious piece of work, but it's also tongue in cheek. You know, I mean, I went right back to my roots. All the time we were doing it, I was calling it Elvis Elvis. <laughs> You know, and it, it's not going back to being Beatle John in the 60s, it's being John Lennon, who was, whose life was changed completely by hearing American rock and roll on the radio as a child. And that's, that's the part of me that's coming out again. That's why I'm enjoying it this time. I'm not trying to compete with my old self or compete with the young new wave kids or anything like that that are coming on. I'm not competing with anything. I'm trying to go back and enjoy it as I enjoyed it originally. And it's, it's working. Oh, that's another thing, yes, we both enjoyed it so much. And that's, you know, really good, isn't it? Yeah, to, to have a, I, mm -hmm. I was saying to somebody the other day, there's only two artists I've ever worked with for more than one night stand, as it were. That's Paul McCartney and Yoko Ono. I think that's a pretty damn good choice. <laughs> because in the history of the Beatles, Paul, met me the first day I did Bebopalula live on stage, okay? And a, f a mutual friend brought him to see my group called the Quarrymen. And we met and we talked after the show, and I'm, I saw he had talent and he was playing guitar backstage and doing 20 Flight Rock by Eddie Cochran. 
And I turned around to him right then on first meeting and said, do you want to join the group? And he said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think he said yes the next day, as I recall it. Now George came through Paul and Ringo came through George, although of course I had a, a say in where they came from, but the only, the person I actually picked as my partner, who I recognized had talent and I could get on with, was Paul. Now, uh, 12, well, however many years later, I met Yoko, I had the same feeling. It was a different field, but I had the same feeling. So I think as a talent scout, I've done pretty <laughs> damn well. Can you tell us about that meeting? With Yoko? Yeah. Well, it was sort of 1966, and uh, I got a call from a, a guy called John Dunbar, who used to be married to Marion Faithful, you know, everybody's connected. And he had a gallery in London called Indica Gallery, an art gallery. And I used to go there occasionally to see whatever art show was on, you see. And he said, oh, I've got this, um, there's this fantastic Japanese girl coming from New York. And she's going to do this other thing, but she's also going to put on a, an exhibition at my gallery. And it's going to be this big event and something about black bags. And I thought, oh, oh, geez, you know. <laughs> well, you know, these artists, they're all ravers. You know, it was in the days of happenings and paint and all that stuff, right? So, oh, I go right down there, you know, for the opening. Goody, goody, you know. You know, let, go down and see what's happening. I get down there and it's the night before the opening. I thought there was going to be a big party and an opening and the whole bit, you know. A big. Ha- I didn't want to get involved, I wanted to watch, you know. I get there, it's all white and quiet and there's just these strange things all on display like an apple on a stand for 200 pound when the pound was worth eight dollars or something or whatever. And there's hammers with insane hammer in it and all this very peculiar stuff and a ladder with a painting on the sky or it looked like a blank canvas on the ceiling with a, with a spyglass hanging from it. So I'm looking around and there doesn't seem to be many people. There's a couple of people downstairs and I didn't know who was who. So I get up the ladder and I, I look through this spyglass and it said yes. And I took that as a personal positive message because most of the avant-garde artists of that period were all negative, you know, like break a piano with an axe. It was mainly male. I'm looking at the female here. <laughs> it was mainly male, male art and it was all destructive and you know. But here was this little crazy message on the ceiling. And then the guy introduced me to her, and she didn't know who the hell I was. She had no idea. She was living in a different environment altogether. And uh, I was saying, well, I thought, this is a good con, isn't it? Apples for 200 pounds and hammer and nail. Who's going to buy this? I didn't know what concept art was, which in a nutshell is the idea is more important than the object. So that's why you won't see many rich concept artists around because you, <laughs> you can't really, you know, like the guy that wraps up uh, that, what's the guy that wraps up the Crystal. Crystal wraps up things. Well, he doesn't expect you to buy the canvas. What he's doing is selling you this idea, whatever it is he's projecting. It was the same kind of thing, but it was, I hadn't come across it before. I was thinking, how do you sell a nail and a hammer, you know? So anyway, the, I said, uh, the uh, gallery owner was all fussing around. He was thinking, well, is he going to buy something? And she's mm-hmm. not. She's ignoring me, you know. Mm-hmm. So he introduced us, and I said, well, uh, where's the event? You know, where's mm-hmm. the happening? Because I'd seen the bag. So she just takes the card out and gives it to me, and just says, breathe. So I said, you mean that? She said, you got it. I said, uh-huh, all right, I'm beginning to catch on here. You know? So, and then I see this hammer, this thing hanging. I just hanging. remember his nose. He did it exactly yeah. like that. Well, you know, what else are you going to do? I, that was the big event, you know, I mean, all the way from New York for that. So I see the hammer hanging on the thing with a few nails and these. I said, well, can I at least hammer a nail in? You know, I've come all the way from the suburbs for this. And she says, no. Because <laughs> before the opening, she, and I Well, it was before the opening. Be she right, didn't want you know? the thing messed up, you know. So anyway, the gallery owner has a little word with her and she, says, she comes over to me and she says, all right, no smiling or anything, because you know how she is. She does, <laughs> she doesn't, she's not running for office. She never was, so she looks at me and she says, you give me five shillings. <laughs> well, that's about ten dollars, maybe no, twenty dollars. Are you kidding? Five shillings about fifty cents or something. Or no, 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 those days are shillings. Anyway, whatever. Right, she's, give me five shillings and you can hammer a nail. And so I looked at her and said, I'll give you an imaginary five shillings and hammer and hammer an imaginary nail in, okay? <laughs> and that's when we connected really 
and we looked at each other like, you know, that sort of, something went on. <laughs> well, I didn't see her again for a few weeks. We went to a Klaus Oldenburg opening and we were all, we, we were to, I went with Paul and I don't know who she was with, but we got, I got separated from Paul and I, I felt this sort of vibe behind me. And I looked around and there she was, you know. And we were both very shy, believe it or not. And mm -hmm. we, I don't know what I said. We said something. I, we didn't really get together till 18 months later. We didn't we make didn't love till two years. We knew two you think years. we're rock and rollers, you know, yeah. all the <laughs> life that people lead. But, and it was, it's all right sort of uh, get coming on with somebody you know that's not going to go anywhere. You know, it's easy to sort of one nice friend and groupies and that, but with a real relationship. I was so paranoid and it was 18 months or a year before we even got near to uh, each other physically as it were. Because <laughs> I didn't know how to tr treat somebody, a, a real woman. I only knew how to treat groupies, really. That's, oh, that's not to say anything against mm -hmm. my first wife, but that was when we were kids and the relationship started when we were both kids. So there was no, it was a different thing altogether. But this was quite a shock for me. To, and somebody who demanded equal rights right from the word go, you know. It was quite a long trip, but we've been together now demanding, longer than the Beatles, right. you know that? That is interesting, isn't it? People always think in terms of John and Yoko just got together in the Beatles split, and we've been together longer than the Beatles. How did your music start reflecting your meeting and your spiritual bond with Yoko? Was it immediate? Oh, it was immediate. Yes, immediate I used to have a, th a place where I worked mm. in the house again upstairs and, and in my first incarnation with mother, wife and kids. <laughs> And I used to make kind of freaky music at home. And I'd, it, you would hear it coming through on things like Tomorrow Never Knows on Revolver or Rain and some little backwards things, but I never made that the whole track. But you had sort of freaky stuff, cassettes. Yeah, cassettes but but at home I would make far freakier stuff, you know, which I would take the sort of most usable and add it to the Beatles or to my tracks of the Beatles, whether it was Walrus or Strawberry or whatever, fiddle around a bit or put loops or, you know, something fun. But at home I was really far out and I had a kind of little studio which was really just a lot of tape recorders and we, we made two virgins that way. She came over for a date as it were and I didn't know what to do and she didn't know what to do. I said, you know, I didn't know what to do with her so I said, you want to <laughs> go upstairs and play with the tapes? You know? <laughs> so, because we didn't know what to do, we did play with the tapes all night. And, we, we made two virgins and I was showing her all my different tape recordings and how I made the funny sounds. You were and running around. I was running around pushing buttons and playing the Mellotron <laughs> and she was, she started into the uh, Yoko Ono stuff which is now uh, stuff you hear on b 52 or Lenny Lovitz and all that stuff. She started doing this oh, oh, and all that and I thought this is great and I was going bloop, 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 on the tapes and she was going oh. And we did, we made a tape all night and in the morning we made love as the <laughs> sun came up. But we'd made, the, we'd made this album's worth of sound together without consciously setting out to make something. And that was the first togetherness. And we, we shot the cover ourselves privately. It wasn't, you know, we just set the, got somebody to set the camera up, took the shot and put out two virgins. That was the start of the whole shebang. And the reaction was, what are, what are they doing? This <laughs> Japanese witch has made him crazy and he's gone bananas. But what, all she did was take the bananas part of me out of the closet more, you know, that had been inhibited by the other part. And did that help you? Oh, it was, it was uh, a, relief, right? a, a complete relief to meet somebody else who was as far out as I was, you know, that was the real thing. The music you make together is, is a pleasure for you to make. At the same time that it is a pleasure for you and you and you enjoy obviously you enjoyed making this album was that it or was there also we wanted to be a commercial success along with the fact that yes we also enjoyed our having a good time oh now we'd like to have a commercial oh, success yes, because definitely. also i mean if i'm taking too much of the time please direct the question to you no, 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 from go all ahead, those years i tend to you know <laughs> hog the conversation it's interesting. But when we made two versions, we weren't worried about commercial. We just wanted to put out a statement of where, where it was at. You know, we wanted to share the thing. Naively. <laughs> well, not naively at all, because some people accepted it and a lot of people That's didn't. True. But the mm. thing had an effect that the fact that, you know, an Elvis Presley would take his clothes off and expose. Now, we, we had other shots for that cover, which made us look a lot more sexy and attractive. Believe me, you know, you know, <laughs> if you pose a certain way and you just do it like this, Better. 
And there were a couple more shots that later came out in the calendar with the uh, live piece in Toronto album where we look a little more attractive as a couple <laughs> in, a, in a star kind so of way. But we deliberately chose the one where we were standing there, you know, in all our glory, like a little flab around the waist, the, the legs a little, you know, no, nothing pretty about it. We wanted to say, we met, we're in love, we want to share it. And it was a kind of statement as well of, of, of an awakening for me too, you know. This Beatle thing that you've heard all about, has, this is how I am really. You know, this is me naked with the woman I love. You want to share it? And people did and people didn't, but now you can't get it for 200 bucks, two versions, <laughs> right? So that's the way it goes. But of course now, she got more interested in pop and I got more interested in avant-garde, so we sort of blended in like that. And I think now we've kind of found a, we're finding a meeting ground, which has only really developed through double fantasy. Where was that time that you got more involved in pop? Where, oh, well, you know <coughs> around approximately Infinite Universe, I think I started to understand, well, it's interesting, you know, and there's a lot of things you can say with it. And so... But even then, around that time, I was more interested in expanding the media of pop into uh, something more theatrical, like Bertolt Brecht type of thing. And so all the songs were long, I think. <laughs> and well, on approximately in the universe, what, what year was that? That was 1971. Yeah, there were very theatrical two. pieces. Yeah, and 1971? One or two, or I'm not sure. One or two or something like that. Two. And uh, they were theatrical, and uh, some of the ideas that she wanted both of us to do then, I must say I was more square then than I am now in a way, that I wish we'd done because now other people have done them because they, and I would say, no, I'm not going to do it. Are you kidding? I'm not going, I'm not doing that. You know, I would go, I would start reserving, you know. So I don't want to do that, you know. We're in enough trouble as it is, you know, let's not do that. And also I started to feel guilty because, for instance, Open Your Box uh, was a good track, you know. And that was on the other, that was approximately yeah. in the universe, also the B-side of Power to the People, just right. to it let was, them know where we're it at. It was not in the approximately in the universe, and oh. it was in 1971, early 1971. And uh, uh, he wrote a song called Part of the People, which is a very powerful song. And then my Open Your Box was on the B-side, and of course that was banned in America, you know, and that sort of thing started to happen. So I felt that maybe I was doing a disfavor to him in a way, because, well, you know, he could be number one all the time, but now because he's involved with somebody a bit radical or this and that, that he's getting that, you know, well, if you ban the B-side, you're banning the <laughs> single, you know, there's that sort of thing. And I was starting to feel guilty a bit. But on, on the uh, other hand, well, we did a lot of interesting things and we were having fun, you know, as well. It was exciting. And also, like, sometime in New York City, which is, again, Bertolt Brecht, and uh, in many interesting tracks. I mean, Women is a Nigga of the World, which, which is was the first... Free. That, that, was, that was banned, Women is a Nigga of the World, because of the word nigger. Now, I had Ebony and Jet both say they are not offended and we went down there with Dick Gregory and, and just in case there were any questions there and the, the statement woman is the nigger of the world was made by Yoko in 1967 or 8 to an English woman's magazine called Nova which was a kind of vogue and she was on the cover and the title was woman is the nigger of the world so I immediately stole the title and wrote a song it didn't come out till 71 and uh, there was all this hullabaloo about the word nigger, but the, the, the hullabaloo was from the white community, you know, mm. not from the black community, because they understood where it was coming from. Because they don't think that they're niggers, and that's why they so, don't care, but I mean, the whites, you know, basically thought, well, niggers, well, that's but terrible. she came <laughs> from a background of classical music, studying piano at five, and all the things that rich kids do, you know. And Schoenberg and Weyburn, she'd studied at Sarah Lawrence and all that. I didn't know any of that stuff. And she was turning me on to Even Bertolt Brecht. I knew we, when we did Sometime New York City, to me, we were doing a newspaper. Mm. So one would rush it out too, into yeah. print, you see. So there were mistakes. Say, a little harmony wasn't perfect. We didn't go back and perfect every note. We just printed it out, you know. And sometimes the, there's words missing or something like that. And it was later that she said, well, you know what, that, what we did there? I said, no, well, we got into a lot of trouble, that's all I know. 
<laughs> and the, you know the harmony's funny, you know something, yeah. Because we had a, a she, her idea again. She had uh, Chairman Mao and N Richard Nixon dancing naked on the cover. They wasn't really their bodies. We just stuck their heads on. Well, the record company stuck a label on it in the supermarkets, and you couldn't even get it off when you went home, you know. And there was no genitals, nothing on it. But anyway, she and I started getting down about that record thing. It was a mistake. We, we even though we tried to say something about women, we tried to say something about love and peace or whatever the war that you know we got into so much trouble and so she then took me to see Richard Foreman's production of the Thrippany Opera of Bertolt Breck which I don't know when it was originally out in the 20s or the 30s I said oh I see so we're not alone you know <laughs> May, I don't know what happened to Breck when he first put that out but it was the same idea meaning you know to make a statement on the society right now right away and don't, no BS just say it you know I think this is wrong that's right that is my opinion you know, it's, it's, it's just music alone is one of the things I was going to ask, and it's a good time. Is it, is it to educate, or is it to entertain, or is it both? Is it to, or doesn't well, it? we were enjoying it too, but <coughs> communicate. Yeah. Communicate is the thing. It's that need to communicate. And, uh, Whatever it is, it doesn't necessarily have to be a political. No, no, no but no. What, what, the politics was in the air those days. Come on, I mean, you know, you couldn't avoid it, right? And... Uh, being artists, when we get into something, we get into it. You know <laughs> what I mean? We wanted to be it's right so there, involved. <laughs> down on the on on the on the front lines. You know, but as we always said to everybody, with flowers, but still right down there. You know, we want to go all the way with it. And uh, I think we did go all the way with it too. You know, We'd, our intentions were good. Well, woman is the nigger of the world, being the most heavy militant feminist thing that was coming out then. Yes, Probably true. still even today. No, that was the uh, the first. It was and before the only Helen Reddy's "I Am Woman" feminist song that was made by a guy. You know, it was and before I Helen really Reddy. I know very, that. Oh, sure, right. Of and she did "Sisters, Oh Sisters" on the B side, yeah. a reggae version. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the point was, I mean, you know, this is something that's going to dawn on somebody else. I mean, people later, but. He was always doing it, you know, and uh, so we were very proud of that that album in that sense. Until it was really knocked, we didn't feel ashamed. <laughs> and you know, that year, uh, Rolling Stone uh, selected us as the most boring couple of the year or something, you know, and really sort of knocked us about it. So, oh, all right. Well, if it's boring, then we won't do <clears throat> it anymore. But everything, every statement to come from the two of you has been taken as. What, what are they doing? Whether it's, it's extremely radical or perceived as kooky or avant-garde, yeah. everything has this hard, tough, I want to get something across to you people. Um, how, how do you feel? I mean, are you, are you trying to get something across or were you? It's to share it. It's yes. like, you know, when you've been somewhere beautiful like Bali and all your friends haven't been and you want to say, my God, I was in Bali, man, and it's just the greatest place ever, and it's mm -hmm. real. You know, and it's that, that's how, how we are about things. We get enthusiastic and excited. Want to sp the same as when I, it sort of dawned on me that love was the answer when I was younger. On the Beatles' Rubber Soul album, the first expression of it was a song called The Word. The Word is Love. In the good and the b bad books I have read, whatever, whatever, where the word is love, seemed like the underlying theme to the universe or to everything that was worthwhile got down to this love 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 thing and it was the struggle to to love <laughs> be loved and express that you know there's something about love that's fantastic even though I'm not always a loving person I want to be that I want to be as loving as possible or in the Christian sense as Christ-like as possible in the Hindu sense as Gandhi-esque as possible and we always approach different and when I met her even though we're from two different schools of thought, as it were, we found that was the common denominator. That's why we became the love and peace couple. Because before I met her, she was protesting against war in a black bag in Trafalgar Square. And when we met and we discussed what we wanted to do together, what we wanted to do was carry on me in my love, 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 and her in her peace, 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 put it together, that's how we came out with the bed in. Because I couldn't go down with John <laughs> Lennon and, and lie in a bag in Trafalgar Square because I might get attacked those days. It was dangerous, it was dangerous for her, even as an individual protest. 
So we developed this thing of how to express what we both believe in together the best we can. And, you know, so you say, uh, going back to that thing, well, you came back. I, w I went to a disco for the first time since 1967, uh, in, in when I was in Bermuda, just before we made this album. And I was finally dragged to a disco by an assistant of mine. And I went there, and upstairs they were playing disco, and downstairs I heard Rock Lobster by the B-52s. <laughs> and I said, that's Yoko? <laughs> and somebody said, I thought there was two records going at once or something. Because I thought it was so like, so her, I thought this person studied her. I, call, I said, get the axe out, call the wife. <laughs> Gee, have you heard this? I called her, I said, I said, you won't believe this, I was in a disco and there's somebody doing your voice. <laughs> I said, this, I said, this time they're ready for us, man. We can go on and do our stuff without even stepping, without even changing a thing. We could go on right back and I dug out the old records we'd made. <laughs> I dug out the B-52s and then I talked to my assistant who tried to turn me on to them 18 months before, but I said, no, I'm not into the music now. I didn't want to hear anything. He was trying to play me Pretenders and Madness and all that stuff and I didn't want to listen to it. And I said, get me some more of this. What's going on out there? He brought all this, you know, cookie, whatever you want to call it, stuff in. And we looked at each other and we thought, ha ha, mm -hmm. they finally caught up to where we were, what we were trying to do all the time, which is another form of expression. And we thought, this time, surely they're going to understand it. And here we are doing it again. It's not that much different from what we did. If you take the Plastic Ono Band albums, which are titleless, I call mine Mother for reference. It had Mother and God and uh, a couple of tracks like that on. And her album, which was a same cover but a kind of reverse trick the first numbers one time right so i can never get more than i've ever had in that respect i'm not saying i could never have four five numbers at once because that's wishing myself bad luck but let's face the reality i've had the boyhood thing of being the elvis and getting my own spot on on the show i want to be with my best friend my best friend my wife who could ask for anything more i'd sooner do something else together than not work together and that's why we i think that comes across in, in the work now and we feel like this is just the start now you see double fantasies i this is mm. our the first album i know we worked together before we even made albums together before but we feel like this is the first album i feel like we nothing happened before today so what is double fantasy what does that mean yeah. well you know where it came from you better tell. I was taking Sean and the nanny and the family to a little, uh, except for mother, who was here selling cows, <laughs> in Bermuda to the botanical gardens for lunch to the Italian restaurant because I could get espresso and Sean could get some junk food. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just walking in, I looked down and it was a botanical garden and it said, we're in the office folks, that's why it's buzzing. Yes. It said, Freesia, double fantasy. And it was some flowers. And I just thought, double fantasy, that's a great title. Because it has so many meanings that you I couldn't even begin to think what it means. So I, it means everything you can think of. I mean, it's a double couple. It's, it's real life, but it's still a fantasy. Because it's, it's, it's now in plastic and in photograph. And it's fantastic. <laughs> and it's just it sort of seemed to be perfect for the for a title of the album. And there's two of us. And it just sort of says it all somehow without really saying anything. It says everything. And it's a flower, actually. And also, you know, in the 10 years, we learned that um, uh, John has his own fantasy, and I, I have mine too, you know. And that's all right, you see. And we don't have to unify our thoughts totally. I mean, there's an overall, overall plan that we have, or a dream that we have, which we share, you know. But then we come from a totally different background, I mean, in a sense of men and women. And that's fine. So we're showing the difference of the fantasies too, you know. That's why it wasn't just all love songs, love, lo losing you and moving on. To show, we're not presenting ourselves as the perfect couple because we don't want to get into that bag either, right? Because when we're trying to present what it is, you know, a relationship that lots of other people are having, but they're maybe not songwriters and they don't express it that way. And the letters we're getting back are from couples, apart from the kids who just like it as music. The, the main excitement is the letters from people who are married with kids or not necessarily married, but relate, relating together. 
and realizing that we're not selling ourselves the perfect couple. We have our problems. We've had our problems. No doubt we'll have problems. But, you know, we're trying. We want to stay together. We want to be a family. And on the, that's the kind of level we're relating to. I'm not aiming, I am not aiming at 16 year olds. If they can dig it, please dig it. But I, I, when I was singing and writing this and working with her, I was visualizing all the people of my age group from mm. the 60s. <laughs> that's true. Being in their 30s and 40s now, just like me, and having wives and children, and having gone through everything together, I'm singing to them. I hope the young kids like it as well, but I'm really talking to the people that grew up with me. I'm saying, here I am now, how are you? How's your relationship going? Did you get through it all? Wasn't the 70s a drag, you know? <laughs> here we are, well, let's try and make the 80s good, you know? Because it's still up to us to make what we can of it. It's not out of our control. I still believe in love, peace. I still believe in positive thinking. When I can do it, I'm not always positive. But when I am, I try and project it. Well, overall, we're getting more and more positive, aren't we? Because somehow, Because we survive. I That's know. the thing. You have Which to give thanks yeah. to God or whatever <clears throat> it is up there. The fact that we all survived. We all survived Vietnam or Watergate or... The, the tremendous upheaval of the whole world that's changed. He, he were the, we were the hip ones in the 60s, but the world is not like the 60s. Anymore. The whole map's changed, and we're going into an unknown future, but we're still all here. We're still wild. There's life. There's hope. So it sounds like instead of the, the down litany of the early 70s, where all the things you don't believe in, now it's... Exactly, and that's why I put the ting, ting, ting on the beginning of starting over. Now, I hope somebody would catch on, but it's easier if I explain it, because I like to be mysterious, a little part of me still likes to be. But in actual fact, the beginning of Mother, the Plastic Ono album, you hear this litany, boom, you know, very slow church bell, which is like a death knell, you know, I don't believe in, I don't believe in, and, and the Freudian things about mother and father. And that was a kind of negative positive. I was trying to make a positive out of, ne out of a negative, but it, it was heavy going. And the reason this one goes ting, ting, ting is to show that I've come through. And whoever's listening must have come through or they wouldn't be here. And that's the, because I always consider my work one piece, whether it be with Beatles, David Bowie, Elton John, Yoko Ono. And I consider that my work won't be finished until I'm dead and buried. And I hope that's a long, long time. So to me, it's one, it's part of one whole piece of work from the time I became public to now. And that's a, the connecting point between that, and you hit it right on the head. And the 80s, it's like we got a new chance, you know? So the multi-year process that went into this evolution to starting over, well, obviously it was filled with a lot of bad stuff as well as oh, good yes, stuff. Oh, of course. It, yeah. what, what was the worst for you? What the was worst was being separate from Yoko and realizing that I really, really needed to be with her, wanted to be with her, and could not literally survive without her as a, as a functioning human being. I just went to pieces, and, no, and I didn't realize that I, that I needed her so much. What do you think is the work that reflected this feeling at the period? Well, I, I, though at that period I did the Walls and Bridges, which is which wasn't bad. it's technically okay, and <coughs> if you if you pull it apart as a, as production or you know format of the songs, there there's nothing wrong with them, but there's an air of loss. There's an air of it's not the same kind of cloud. Or it's not the same kind of thing as the Mother album, where there's a it's a positive negative. You know, it's saying this is where I'm at and this is how it's going. And it, you could say it was a film where you came out crying from that movie. Walls and Bridges has this air of misery, but you can't put your hand on it. There's a kind of cloud around it. If you look closely, you can say, <laughs> Bless You is a, is a nice song, nothing wrong with it, good construction, good heart. You know, you can go into it and look at it and can't find the fault as an, a piece of art. But overall, there's some horrible confusion and loneliness in it that, that is apparent from the whole album that it gives off. Number nine, dream always seemed to me the most wistful, longing song. That's how I felt, my dear. <laughs> I, I mean, I was haunted, all right, because I realized that uh, I needed her more than she needed me, and I always thought the boot was on the other foot. <laughs> you know, and that's, uh, that's as honest as I can get. And the image is always because the pop star, and Burt Reynolds said it the other night, and God bless him, 
<laughs> that uh, he, he, he's, the women have always kicked him out. And Yoko kicked me out. I didn't go off on a, I'm going to be a rock and roll uh, bachelor. She literally said, get out. You know, and I said, oh, okay, okay, I'm going. You know, I'm going <laughs> bachelor free. I'd been married all my life. <laughs> you know, I'd been married before Yoko, and I, uh, I immediately married Yoko, so I'd never been a bachelor since I was 20 or something. So I thought, woo -hoo -ha -ha! <laughs> It was god-awful! <laughs> it was awful! Isn't that the way we all survive? What kind of, isn't that the way we protect our... By doing that, going through that kind of... If somebody does that, you say, oh, cool, I'm not going to... Yeah, you, you know, I was going to be mystical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you see, I was seven... I, was, I call it the seven-year hitch. I don't know what it was, but <laughs> it was horrific, and uh, it didn't take. It took me a long time to catch on because I, I uh, drank too much, and you know the rest. A lot of it's known already, and I don't want to keep gurging it up. But I wasn't too, you know, I was out of control, and nobody was looking after me, and uh, I, I needed somebody to love me, and there was nobody there to support me, and I, I w fell apart. Another thing I want to say about Bert Reynolds the other night, Barbara Walters asked him what do you want to be remembered as? And he said, the best father that ever Did was. You? Yeah. That's and beautiful. I thought, thank God, you know, I began <laughs> to feel maybe I'm the only father that's interested in relating. And I, is it going to become, oh, John Lennon's now selling this family business and he's, he's been through peace and love and now he's coming on like daddy and all that. And I'm only talking about it because that's what I've done and that's how I feel. And admitting that, that it is that I'm, I'm more feminist now than I was when I sang Woman is the Nigger. I was intellectually a feminist then, but I, now I feel as though I've, at least I've put my, m not my money, but my mouth, my body where my mouth was mm -hmm. and tried to really live up to my own preachings, as it were. And to see somebody like Burt Reynolds, who is the world's number one male star over all the pop stars worldwide, to have the guts to say he wants to be known as a, as a father. I thought, oh great, I'm not going to be alone on this one. Oh, and I get good, letters yeah. from people saying, I'm not alone. I get letters mm. from guys saying, mm. well, I'm doing it too, you know, <laughs> you're not the only one. It kind of destroys it much, oh, well, let's see how many, you know, see how many women we can be with. Well, I want to go through life as a, pretending to be James Dean or Marlon Brando, you know? In a movie, not in real life even, in a movie version of them. Just the fact that you're living so many of the things that you were singing about, talking about, trying to get across years ago, does that make you think that maybe you were a little bit false or just image-oriented back then? No, I think that it wasn't yeah. image-oriented. It was just going <clears throat> as fast as... I mean, not only the fact that we got together and boom, it was like an explosion, but there was also the Beatle thing about us getting together and whether they split because of us or not or whatever the reason, all that stuff. The Beatles were splitting, the Beatles were arguing, John and Yoko was getting together, the anti-Vietnam crusades were going on all over, and we were involved in so many things, and we were putting out so much work, and we were making movies, making public appearances, uh, performing at shows, and all, and traveling the world and doing all that. There was no time to reflect, there was only time to put out immediate impressions of what was happening. Well, we were really honest about it. We you can be. say that, you know, maybe we were naive, but still we were very honest about everything we did, you know. That's why I refer to the word is love on Robert Soul. Straight to, through to all you need is love, to give peace a chance, to imagine there's no countries, imagine no war, in other words, to, to write to this moment now. And starting But the over. thing is, instead of, th this album doesn't say imagine the whole world like that because I've said that in a way what I'm saying now is now let's put the spotlight on the two of us and show how we're trying to imagine there's no wars to live that love and peace rather than sing about it only can you two sing about love is it possible to define what love is or is just a person is that a personal thing between each two 
Is it all different? I don't know. Well, I look, I mean, love is love, is. isn't it? I mean, you know it too. We know, you know. what it is, but you can't define yeah. it. You know. you know, I mean, everybody knows what love is. I mean, it's not something that you can explain, but it's a, a very strong energy and power. I tried to define it on the Plastic Ono it's like a magic, album with a song called power. Love Was Love on Plastic Ono or on Imagine. Yes, yes it was on Plastic Well, I tried to define it as in my own way then, like, love is real, real is love. And it, it's very sim simple lyric, or even simplicity, I don't know which way it would go, but it's, a, what can you call it? You can say, love is like a flower. It's you like know, saying, you know, you what is air? And you yes. say H2O, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. You know? It's whatever it is, when it feels good, is love, and the other one it's is not, not love. love you know? <laughs> on that same album, when you first sang, hold on, did you have any idea of the things you were going to go through? No. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> No Amazing, idea. isn't it? No idea. Oh, but the other thing is, you know, because John explained <laughs> it, so I have to uh, s explain my side of it, is that it's almost like, maybe it's almost like John and I are sort of a prototype of that situation, but because the world was pressuring me so much, I mean, really too much, and really suffocating me in a sense that I can't work anymore. And when John was in L.A., I really had... Uh, enough space to think about it and all that. I realized it was the society, it wasn't John so much, it was the society that's really uh, messing the whole thing up, you know. And when John came to New York once to sort of wanting to come back, and I said... And Not quite on his knees, but <laughs> one knee. And, you know, he sort of sang that Bless You song to me, you know, and I was crying, actually. Because that was to Yoko. Mm. And uh, we were just sort of holding each other and crying because I thought, my God, it's beautiful and everything. But still I thought, no, 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 let's not get emotional, let's not get tricked again because if I uh, accept him back, that whole shebang is going to start again, you know. So let's be cool about this, you know. And I was crying, but I said, okay, well, look, I'll see you later, you know. <laughs> and it was hard for me too. And what I'm saying is that, uh, oh, maybe on a, a different level maybe, but most women are in that position that I was in. And so that if men and women are going to come back together again, then men has to really make a, a big step forward, you know, like to try to extend their hand and try to really almost make up for what women lost or in the society, so to speak. So it's hard for men too. But that's the only way I think it's going to happen, you know. Because, um, I mean, I, I tried my best, but still, <clears throat> if I were to just be normally healthy, I had to get that from John. If I didn't, I would have gone crazy anyway. So, you know, it wouldn't have been a relationship. You know, he would have had a wife that accepted him back, but I would be in a mental hospital or <laughs> something, you know. My wife is in a mental hospital. I would have visited. <laughs> well, you know, I'm that kind of guy, you know. when you first heard Woman, did that make you cry? Oh, yes, yes. I played that for, this is just, and I'll be real quick and then I'll shut up. I played that for my wife and I told her, pretend it's She cried. Well, I'm, 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 well, because that's a, what I am, you know, I'm 40, I want to talk to the people my age. I'm happy if the young people like it, and I'm happy if the old people like it. I'm talking to guys and gals that, that have been through what we went through together. The 60s group that has survived. Survived the war, the drugs, the politics, the, the violence on the street, the whole shebang that we've survived it. And we're here, and I'm talking to them. And the woman song is to Yoko, but it's to all women. And... Because my role in society, or any artist or poet's role, is to try and express what we all feel. Not to tell people how to feel, not as a preacher, not as a leader, but as a reflection of us all. And it's like, that's the job of the artist in society, not to... It's, they're not some alienated being living on the outskirts of town. It's fine to live on the outskirts of town, but artists must reflect what we all are. That's what it's about, artists or poets, or whatever you want to call it. And that's what I'm trying to express on behalf of all the men to all the women. Through my own feelings about women, when it dawned on me, you know, my God, it is the other half of the sky, as the late, great Chairman MacDougall said, right? I mean, they are the other half of the sky, and without them there is nothing. 
And without us, there's nothing. There's only the two together. Create children, create society. So what's all it's this BS that. about, you know, women are this and men are that? We're all human, man. We're all human. And I am trying to say it to Yoko, but to all women, you know, on behalf of all men, in a way, if that's taking it too much on myself, I feel that artists are that, the reflection of society. That's true, yeah. But I mean, Mirrors. the thing that I went through when we were separated was amazing. I mean, down to if uh, I'm outside and reporters would ask, well, do you think John's going to ever get back to you? Or, you know, that sort of nonsense, you know. Or poor Yoko, you know, lonely in Dakota all by herself because her husband is or whatever. And it's that image is so humiliating. But I wasn't going to stand up and say something because that would humiliate his macho image, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing is, well, so he was having a headache because he got drunk or something and he had a hangover or something. Well, so that's men, you know, that's sort of all right, creating his own headache. But I was getting a headache because of all these people saying, you know, sort of nonsense. Well, me and Bert have owned up. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Well, double fantasy doesn't seem to be at all the, the first fantasy or the first what-if situation. Um, imagine, of course, said, you know, what if this, what if that. Yeah, yeah. How did, how did that come out for you? How do you mean, how did the imagine how, come out? How yeah, were you, were you really wondering to yourself or were you trying to get other people to look and say, hey, what if we did with that thing? Well, it was, uh, it should really have said Lennon Ono on that song because she contributed a lot. Of, to that song and Imagine was straight lift out of her book Grapefruit. There are pieces in there that say imagine this, imagine that. Uh, but I, what, you know, so I didn't give her credit. <laughs> la, 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 la. But the point the being, album yes, was dedicated yeah, because, to me instead. Because people, <laughs> so I dedicated the album to her, which is a cop out, but you know, well, I was, you know, I was only as honest as I could be then, you see. You can only be as uh, what you think, you know, as best you can at the time. But the point of the song, right, is because people keep saying, well, what were you doing? What are you doing in the bed in? What are you doing to virgins? What are you doing together? What are you doing? What are you doing? That's where we first came out with, all we're saying is give peace a chance. Literally came out of my mouth as a, as a spoken word to a reporter. After being asked millions and millions of times, what are you doing? Well, what, all I'm saying is give peace a chance. Not that I have the answer or, or I've got a new format for society, because I don't. And, I don't believe anybody else has. Show me the plan, there's revolutions there. You know, uh, the Beatles revolution, or my revolution song says, show me the plan before we knock all the buildings down, you know. But give peace a chance, it is, imagine is the same thing, you hit it right in the head. It's just imagine if there were no countries. Not no places where we each had our little spot. But imagine, there was a time, you know, when you didn't have to have a passport to go from country to country. What kind of world do we create? Really, it used to be you could go around, you know. What is this game that you can't get, that somehow this is America and then just across the, the field is Canada and that you have to have all kinds of papers and pictures and stamps and passports and, you know, I mean, when you think about it, it's insane. It's insane carving up the world into little patches like that. But We're all different. <laughs> but will there will always, always be the Idi Amins and the, and the Ayatollahs and whoever that kind of make that very difficult at some point. Or but well, I, I don't know my history well enough to know how people got on in the past, you know. But when Marco Polo went to visit the Chinese, no doubt it was risky leaving Rome and going through all those countries. Or when the Crusaders left, not on, as a massed army, but just as peasants getting up and trickling off across, they must have gone through, but of course you're going to come across some, there's, maybe there's always going to be nuts, I don't know. No, no, but, but still, it's in, the concept of imagining no countries, imagining no religion, not imagining no God, although you're entitled to do that too, imagining no denominations, Separation. imagining that we re revere Jesus Christ, Mohammed, Krishna, Milarepa, equally, we don't have to worship e either one that we don't have to, but imagine there's no Catholic Protestant, no Jew Christian, that we allow all, allow it all, freedom of religion for real, I mean, for real. 
Just imagine it. Would it be so terrible? You see, because the point is, uh, people like George Orwell, and by the way, incidentally, he's, he's a guy too. But I mean, all these guys <clears throat> have projected a very negative view of the future. And imagining a projection is a very strong magic power, you know. I mean, that, that's the way society was created. And so because they're setting up all these negative images, and of course that's going to create the society. So we were trying to create a more positive image, which is, of course, going to set up another kind of society. And, uh, you know, even in all this, we always had this a human race dream, you know, like we always wanted to fly, so now we have planes, you know. And the next probably dream is wanting to be peaceful. Well, the other great of we can... dream of mankind, mm. one was to fly, mm. which might have taken us a long time, but it took somebody to imagine it first. Yes, mm -hmm. kept imagining. Second was reach the moon, right? Yes, which we reached. Uh, which we reached. Mm. Now, that was, it was, uh, sure, it was an American in an American rocket because that was the way history was at that time. But mankind reached the moon because they said one giant step for mankind. It was for all of us we went to the we moon. We were always saying, you know, like wanting the moon or, you know. This but nowadays even football players are doing it, right? Which we were doing then, which is projecting the future in a positive way. Now people will say, no, you're naive, you're dumb, you're stupid. We'd, okay, it might have hurt us on a personal level to be called names. But what we were doing, you can call it magic, meditation, projection of goal, which business people do. They have courses on it. The footballers do it. They pray, they meditate before the game. They visualize themselves winning. Billie Jean King visualizes every move of the, on the court. What we were doing, we were early pioneers of that movement, which is to project a future which we can have goals which we can reach. Right? People project their own future. So what we wanted to do was say, let's imagine a nice future. She's right. The males like even Aldous Huxley and George Orwell, who pr produced 1984, you look into uh, Orwell's life, it was all torture and this, that and the other, and he was brought up in a certain environment in a male-dominated society full of Marxist stuff about Spain, and they were all from the third, whatever, whatever that period when they, when they had those dreams of socialism answering everything, right? And their dreams fell to dust after the war, and then they wrote these books projecting this horrific Big Brother, monsters controlled by robots, and even now, the, I think uh, these people that project the space fantasies are projecting war in space continually, with women in miniskirts, mm -hmm. available sexual mm -hmm. objects, and the men with super macho John mm -hmm. Wayne guns on their hips. Big I'm saying it's time for the people to get hip to that, man, because they're projecting our future. Do we want to our children to be out in space, or grandchildren, fighting maybe not Russians, but Venusians in space. <laughs> you see, if it works for a football player and a tennis player, it can work for all of us. We have to project a positive future. I, I mean, I think that's what Christ and Mohammed and those people were saying in their way, in their time, for, the, for their society. If we, if we look back to, if, if we think of the 60s as somewhat more of a liberal time, we, the country or the world was leaning to the left, if you want to say that, we just finished an election. If all the analysts are correct, the country, this country, has made a swing to the right. England, with the election yes, of Thatcher, yes. and making that move somehow to a more conservative stance. And you wrote a song called "Power to the People." The power to the people. Uh, if, if it is true that 53 percent of the people in this country voted at all, but even cared. Do the people, do you think they have more power? Oh, sure, they, definitely. They, they, no, no, they, really they always more? had a lot of power. I mean, you know, people like politicians rely on the fact that the people are not thinking. You know? And if each person, all of us, would really be centered, you know, and really start thinking for ourselves, then they don't have a chance. <coughs> because you see, I, we're like a really very powerful gods and goddesses, you know? You know, with the, in retrospect, if I was trying to say that same thing again, I would say the people have the power, mm. I don't mean power of the gun, they have the power to make and create the society they want. We, we all created this together, it wasn't a few kings or a few generals. We might have invested the power in a Napoleon, or the Germans might have been hypnotized by Hitler, 
Does that make the Germans different from the rest of the human race? No way. You know it could have happened anywhere. It just happened there at that moment in time. Okay? And also, the world, does, we do breathe in and we breathe out. So you go to the left, you go to the right. It's all, in, a, in the long term, it's meaningless. Even since I was a, a conscious of politics, it was the right in the 50s, the left in the 60s, and sort of nothing in the 70s. And it's going to the right. The, if everybody's going to panic and just react to an illusionary right wing that's going to kill everybody, well, that's what you're going to get. I believe that it doesn't have to be like that just because the guy has a right wing or a, supposedly a, <coughs> has a different political view than other people. Now, personally, I've never voted in my life. How do you like that? Now, there's a Beatles book that was handed out in the 1964 tour a book of photographs, and on the top of it, it shows this young John Lennon in his usual big mouth way, saying, no phony politician's ever going to get through to me. Well, I take the phony politician out because I don't think any, all when politicians phony. are phony. I don't think, or I won't categorize even politicians now, now because I've learned a, a lot since I was 23. But I don't think politics is the only answer, you see. I, don't, no. I think this idea that we elect these leaders and then expect them to do miracles for us. Now, the, Kennedy is a big dream for everybody because he didn't live to fulfill or let us down. And it's not to negate what Kennedy was and what he means to people, but the reality is, had he lived, how do you know how well he would have done at the time, right? Or how the war would have gone and how everything would have gone. So investing leaders with supernatural powers, whether they be pop stars, politicians, or movie stars, or football heroes, it don't work. It just doesn't work. Because we put them up on the pedestal and immediately we want to knock them off. So Regan's going to go in there. All the so-called rightists are all going to be waiting for him to do what they want. And when he doesn't, because it's impossible, because the presidency is such a vast, awe-inspiring position for any man to be in, <coughs> and it means a lot more than some local right-left group, that he cannot possibly fulfill the dreams of the right wing the same way as Carter or Kennedy could never fulfill the dreams of the left wing. It, it is too much invested in one man, one group. And I don't believe in that. Well, that's what Tuffler says. I think that, that... I mean, he says that basically we're, it's all an outdated system. It the is system an outdated system. Exactly. It, it has no... It can't work no matter who. That's why I'm the, from the generation that don't, doesn't vote. I will never vote for one of those people because I know none of, none of them can ever do anything for me. But there's a grassroots movement, you know. I'm not talking about underground or radical or anything like that, but every community counts. I mean, we have to first take care of our household, our family, and our community, um, our city, you know. And if each person would think that way, it's going to work. But the, that, that, that's Instead of the, investing the our energies to one person but or a government. It doesn't mean that. When you speak of power and you have, and you have people, a number of people at least, if, if you look at polls and people that do research, that say, well, it's the oil companies and everything, it's corporate structures running our lives and they really, have, we can't do anything. We're totally powerless so we're just kind of apathetic with giving up, which seems to be, if, we, if you believe what the media tells us is, is taking place. I wonder, that's the question. Yeah, but no, who no, believes no, no. the media? Investing the that's media in such power yes, is, a, is, is a joke as well. Mm. You know? Media is not the, the truth. Who gave the media the... They are part of the power system anyway, but I'm not pointing fingers. You understand that I don't believe the media are separate from society. I don't believe politi politicians are separate from society. I don't believe pop stars, football players, and movie stars are separate from society. It's just that we've developed this thing for whatever reason that we think they are, that each, we're broken up into these fragmented pieces, countries, sexes, races. It's a joke. It's as Neanderthal is the political system. It's just, you know, it's just like, I can't say what it, what it should be, you see, because I can only say, I don't believe in that stuff, you know, and that's well, enough. In a way that we are all creating these illusions and then trusting the illusion, and media is not the truth, politician is not the truth. I mean, truth lies in us, all of us, each of us, you know. And if we can just bring this power inside us to cope with the daily life and cope with the situation, whatever you're in, you know, then they'll be all right.
That's a very holistic approach, not well, like... Well, exactly. Holistic yeah. is what we need, not just in the health field. We need it in the political yeah. field, in the global field, and stop this paranoia of 90-year-old men playing macho games with the world and possibly the galaxy. That's, That's your what daddy. they're doing. That's a very powerful position, the fact that you can, you can make statements or you can put an album out like double We are fully aware of our power. Of yes, we we're fully aware of our power, whatever that is, and we nurture it and we try to be very careful about our own life because of that. And also try to communicate and, you know, communicate as much as we can with that power, you know. But all of you do, in a way. So, in degrees, you know, and then that's what you should use and that's what it means to communicate and to tell each other, reassure each other that we are here together, you know. I think something uh, underlying what Yoko's been saying is that we, have, we do have a lot of power and people, a lot of people just don't know how to use and don't believe enough in themselves to use that power that they have inside of them. But, but it is changing, I must say, look, or when I say, oh, football players are doing and businessmen are doing. I mean, the fact is, people are believing in projecting their own power, visualizing goals, visualizing positiveness, and, and, and doing these things that, it's that a different are changing, age, yeah. changing the world. It, it all takes time. You see, I think that the bit about, you know, the 60s, we we're all full of hope, and then everybody got depressed, and the 70s were terrible. That attitude that everybody has, that the 60s was, was therefore negated for being naive and dumb, and the 70s is really where it's at, which means, you know, putting makeup on and dancing in the disco, which was fine for the 70s. But I don't negate the 60s, I don't negate the 70s. The, the, the seeds that were planted in the 60s, and possibly they were planted generations before, but the seed that whatever happened in the 60s, the, the flowering of that is in the feminist, feminization of society, the meditation, the positive learning that people are doing in all walks of life. That is a direct result of the opening up of the 60s. Now maybe in the 60s we were naive and like children everybody went back to their room and said, well we didn't get a wonderful world of, of <laughs> just flowers and peace and happy <laughs> chocolate and, and, and it wasn't just pretty and beautiful all the time. And that's what everybody did. We didn't get everything we wanted, just like babies. And everybody went back to their rooms and soaked. And we're just going to play rock and roll and not do anything else. We're going to stay in our rooms. And the world is a nasty, horrible place because it didn't give us everything we cried for. Right? Crying for it wasn't enough. The thing the 60s did was show us the possibility and the responsibility that we all had. It wasn't the answer, it just gave us a glimpse of the possibility. And in the 70s, everybody's going, nye, 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 nye. and possibly in the 80s, maybe everybody will say, okay, well, let's, let's project the positive side of life again. You know, it, the world's been going on a long time, right? It's probably going to go on a long time. But also, you know, so the 60s was uh, sort of... Uh, really going out and communicating and expanding but in the 70s people think that nothing happened but in a way we went back inside us there's a lot of very interesting magical psych psychic things that happened you know and people got tuned into and so with the 60s expansion and 70s knowledge i think 80s is going to be another step up you know and be beautiful you know do you think people if people had realized the holistic potential for healing and growth within them, that that would have stopped, say, a lot of people from running to, oh, certain movements, religious, psychological, whatever, for sudden answers. Yeah, I think, but there's, there's that part of us all, including myself, that wants to belong to some group. No, I don't mean a rock group, but a group in society, because it, it, it makes you feel secure when times are, are hard, or there seems to be a threat of war, or a threat of monetary crisis and and the media with help from the public and the politicians hype it up that it's the end of the world or the end of america or the end of financial empire or whatever it is and everybody gets insecure and wants to belong to a group including me i'm you know i was always wanting to belong to something <laughs> even though i always wanted to be the rebel on the outside part of me always wanted to be part of it 
And it, it's an insecurity. I'm not saying that anybody who's, who's become a born-again Christian or a born-again whatever the other groups are, but in general, to me, it looks like a sign of insecurity because I recognize it in myself that when I do go through that terrible insecurity of the world is collapsing and going crazy, it doesn't make sense anymore. Wouldn't it be easier if I was just along with these people, this few hundred or few thousand that all think the same way and it makes life easier like that? But and I think if people that. realize that it's not the end of the world, the apocalypse is not going to happen, no matter what some person might threaten us with, those people have been waving those end of the world. I remember those, the, world, the end of the world is nigh cartoons when I was 12, you know. The, the, my whole generation, our whole generation was brought up with the H-bomb. I remember Bertrand Russell and all the H-bomb and the reason that we were rock and rollers apparently in the 50s was because the bomb might go off any minute. Okay, so... Drills in school, okay. Right, I'll right. But, you know, I mean, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. I really don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. And what happens if it happens? Well... Just what happens if they drop the bombs all over the earth? What's going to happen? Is somebody going to answer that? Hmm. We're either going to live or we're going to die. If we're dead, we'll have to deal with that. If we're alive, we've got to deal with being alive. So worrying about whether Wall Street or the apocalypse is going to come in the form of the great beast is not going to do us any good day to day. You mentioned you, when you did this album, you were talking mainly, if, you, if the kids like it, great, but the 30s, people in the 30s and 40s, yeah. who are really the bulk of, that we just happen to be that baby boom generation. Yeah, it's yeah. the aging of America now, we all are getting older. Mm -hmm. But is, if, if the cliche is true that supposedly we all become more conservative or mellow or whatever you want, you want to call it as we get, as we get older, that's what our parents said, wait till, you know, sure you're a radical now, but wait till about 20 years or 10 years, come back and, you know, you're going to be, do you, do you see that happening or do you see that happening to yourself? I mean, listening to this album, which is obviously a little, a little mellower and a little... Well, well is it mellower than... Um all you need is love or softer yeah well i tell you what you see you don't have to atrophy because you get older if that's the right way of saying that you see now the thing about when you get older you become this if you believe that myth it's again the belief system of you know when we were kids 30 was death right the whole culture was like right i'm 40 now and i feel just i feel better than before you see, know? I think the whole concept you, you of can artists, just let me think, yeah. you can atrophy your ideas of life at 20 or 30 or 40. I know some kids that left school at the same time as me yeah. who were within six months of getting a job were absolutely locked in. You could say conservative. They might have been conservative socialists in England. There's just as many conservatives on the left as there are on the right. It's not a matter of politics conservative. It's a matter of things you don't get so emotionally up and down when you're older because when you're younger your genes are different your hormones are different so it absolutely has to express different you can become mellower without becoming rigid i'm still open to anything i still believe almost in anything until it's disproved i don't have any set pattern i don't have any set answers i'm as open as ever but i just maybe not so my hormones don't work the same, no, I that's think it's, all. Look, I think it's totally the opposite. I mean, all these menopausal men are the <laughs> ones who are really violent and they're thinking about killing five, five million people. What's mellow about that, you know? And the thing is, young people in love and they're tender. I mean, go back to I want to hold your hand. They're very more mellow songs. What are you talking about? You know, and we're talking about starting over. We're talking about, about falling in love again to each other, you know. And that's the most beautiful, young, fresh thing to do. Nobody in the menopausal age can do that. And you're having it totally reversed. So this conventional idea that if people are talking about love, that means that they're out of, out of the game, you know. And people who are talking about, uh, you know, I want to kick your pants or whatever, you know, or <laughs> I, I want to kick your pants. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> or, you know, something like that, or some violent song is uh, right on youth or something. It's a totally uh, wrong idea. 
the, the most useful thing is to be in love, to be tender, to know about sensitivity, you know. And as you grow older, you become less sensitive. And then you start thinking about ordering around people, pushing buttons and making the atomic bomb go, you know. So I think, you know, your question is already wrong, you know. I was speaking mainly, and may, I didn't probably didn't word it correctly, but I was speaking mainly of music. In, in one way. Music. Oh, I see. I mean, you know, wait a second. You thought I mentioned AC. Hey, well, yeah. listen to Kiss, 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 and she's right. 47, right? So kiss, come kiss, on. Kiss, <laughs> but, but for people, a lot, of, a lot of radio people somehow have this idea that once people reach the age of 25 or 30 and they're yeah. appealing to these formats, we can only be very mental on because the people that once wanted to hear Elvis Presley and Little Richard and the Beatles rock and roll, mm. whatever. I don't believe that, now, do you? Now, all of a sudden, can only play back and. If I and listen I to the oldies, but only, only from that. if the oldies but goldies come on, it's one of my favorites. If I hear Bebop Lula, I can hear it over and over again. Every time it comes on, I switch up the thing, and I have the record still. If I hear Elvis, I heard him singing, I want, need, I want you, I need you, I love you the other day. I mean, I was just in heaven. I know, of course, I was going back to my youth and remembering the dates and what was going on when I heard that music. So I don't believe that, that the the AC, or what, what I used to know as M.O.R., M-O-R. only want to hear Barry Manilow. I think they just as well in, might enjoy hearing Little Richard. Well, but music-wise, even, you know, uh, music is just a format, and we're adding many different formats, and that's interesting. But New Wave is going to be old one, one day, too, you know. Old hat, and yeah, minute. it'll be old hat. The minute yeah, it's, it's out hat. there, and it's number one, that means that it's old hat, you know. And I think it's nice to discover all different forms of music and that's nice but at the same time that doesn't mean the old form doesn't uh, mean anything in fact if a young uh, young generation person uh, picked up a, a very old form like Elvis or something and did it you wouldn't call it well he's mellowing I'll give you like for that, instance you know. Bruce Springsteen's Hungry Heart which I think is a great record is to me it's the same kind of period sound as starting over I think the cars touch and go is right out of the 50s. Oh, 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 that new wave, a lot of it is 50s stuff. But with the 80s styling, yes, but, and, like and that's what I think way starting way. over is. It's a 50s song made with an 80s approach. Are we on? Forever here, yeah. or, uh, did you say anything about that? Or well, you know, um, we have like, to make the other album first program. I'd like to make at least, I, I'm so hungry for making records because of the, the way I feel, I want to make some more records before a tour, so I'd like to make at least one more album before actually just making that final decision of calling those very expensive session musicians and taking them on the road, you know? Mm-hmm. But when I went in there, I had no intention of going live because I've noticed a lot of people like Clash and things like that don't do any personal appearance hardly anymore and they just make a video on the record. And so part of me would think, oh, I, but when we were playing in that studio, and then I don't know whether it was Tony, the bass player, or the drummer, after we'd done starting over, he said, can we do this again? I mean, let's take it on the road. And that was the first time it came. I thought, my God, this would be fun, wouldn't it? And if we can do it in the way we've done the album, which is have fun, enjoy the music, enjoy the performance, be accepted as John and Yoko, then I'd be happy to go out there. In small, but I, large, large halls. That's the thing, you see... I don't, I, I, that's the bit I don't want to think about, you know. I don't, don't know, know whether yet. Madison Square Garden is what I really want to do, but then can I really go into a small club and am I going to have to deal with, oh, he couldn't make Madison Square Garden anymore. Oh, I, do I have to care? Do I care? I don't know. But it's certainly a very big possibility that when we get the next album tucked away and people know the songs from Double Fantasy, mm-hmm. we can go out and perform from Double Fantasy and the new album rather than having to go back even to Imagine, although we might do it, or even before Imagine. I don't really want to go out and do yesterday. (laughs) (laughs) All my troubles seem so far away. I mean, only if I I particularly wanted to do an old old Beatles song, would I want to do it. I really don't want to get into that, you know. Great, thank you. Yeah, what you oh, what is that? Present from Lauren. Sure. Oh, that's sure. great, thank you. That's very kind. Okay, okay, okay I'll do it. <laughs> I'd love to you sign it. it. Yeah, I did the introduction. Yeah, I, I read it. it. Yeah, that's oh, wow, we love it. 
They make them in Godzilla. Oh, they he loves. The they love monsters, you know. All this peace and love talk. He loves weapons and space fights and all, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got a pen here. Yeah. Could you just I love the way this went. Uh, I, I really had a good time. Baby? Yeah. It was enjoyable.